Okay, so folks who are watching the recording of this, uh, your club president goofed and forgot to turn on the recording. So we've already started. You've missed all of the uh, business stuff. Uh, but um, here's David Akubian start starting his presentation on composition. And for those of you that that missed the the part that wasn't recorded, um, we gave away a car and ten thousand dollars in cash. Um, so sorry about that. You had to be online to see it. So anyway, so um, my father gave me a camera back in 1972, um, thinking that it would force me to interact with people. And it probably did the opposite. Instead, I spent more time out in the woods taking pictures of bugs and rocks and birds and snakes and everything else. Um, he put me on the annual staff and I spent most of my time photographing abstract stuff in the school. Um, but I found out we, we had a dark room in our basement and I found out that I really enjoyed the, the creation part of it more so than the finished product. So um, to me, it took too long, you know, six months to paint a mural sometimes, but it took me 20 minutes to do an image, process the film and start printing. So I really pretty much gave up the paintbrushes and the charcoals. I still play with them, but primarily I photograph now. But the beneficial thing for me has been all the same basic principles that I learned as an illustrator have carried over into photography. So I think that when, when people look at, at photographs, you never really look at the technical side, you look at the compositional side. And that's really what separates each one of us individually. Um, no one's better than anyone else, it's just we all see things differently. And I think that's important because when I was an illustrator, I would take elements and I would arrange them with the way that I wanted to on the canvas. But as a photographer, you have to do that by actually going out and changing your position, changing your lens, changing the lighting, something that you can do to, to arrange those elements like you would normally in, in, a, in a painting. So that's, that's where my background comes in. Um, so what I wanna to do tonight is talk about simply composing an image or composition. Um, I've got a lot of images to look at, so we'll, we'll try to get through. Uh, but it's going to be based more on the landscape aspect of it because it's easier to illustrate that than it is with the wildlife and macro and everything else as well. With macro, just think of it as a micro landscape. So whatever you would do is in a landscape, you would just translate over to macro. And I tell people, if you want to get better in your landscape photography, do macro because your mistakes are amplified. The, the good stuff that you do is amplified as well. So when you learn to do it in macro, it just carries over naturally. Um, there's not going to be a test on the spelling of my name or anything like that, so don't worry. Let's see, uh, you just, oh, yeah. I think it was because he had looked at something else. Uh, so I am one of the Tamron professionals. Um, there's three different groups in there. There's image masters, ambassadors, and professionals. Um, the image master, I think those are the guys that have been there the longest. I've been with Tamron uh, as a professional for like 17, 18 years now. Um, all the lenses that I use are Tamron. Love the stuff. So let's see. There we go. So what let's take and you guys to start think of what uh, thinking of what you're doing as creating an image versus taking a picture. Because when you take a picture, you're doing nothing more than reporting a moment in time. And that moment, but you're just recording that moment in time. You created, taking time to light. Uh, you're finding elements as leading lines, as anchor points. You're thinking about asymmetrical versus symmetrical compositions. And we're going to talk about that as well. So, what I want to try to do is get you to realize that an image is more of capturing a memory of that moment in time. You know, I can't tell you, seriously, I cannot tell you what I had for dinner last night, um, but I can tell you almost any one of the images that I'll show who was standing beside me, what the temperature was, I was what I was wearing, blue jeans, a t-shirt, and a regular shirt. Now, that one was an easy one. Um, but I think that that for me, it embeds it in my mind a little bit better. So you're creating the memory of that moment. And the way that you do that is you get the viewer's attention and you control what they see in your image. 
you know, they, they look at something first and they, you lead them through the image to your final point. And it may not always be the final point, may not be the subject. It could be something else because a lot of times the subject in my image, even though you see the mountains and the Tetons, um, that may be just an afterthought. There may be you to see. So everything sort of together. Composition is the tool we use to lead the viewer through to the desired subject. Um, and again, that's going to be, we're going to talk about leading lines. We're going to talk about elements. We're going to talk about that rule of thirds. So let me get this out of the way real quick. Who knows what the rule of thirds is? Barry, you raised your hand first. What's the rule of thirds? I won't put you on the spot. So the rule of thirds, all that it's designed to do there's two types of composition. There's symmetrical, which is referred to as bullseye. Then there's asymmetrical, which you're purposely creating visual tension. You don't want the viewer to go to one point. You want the viewer to study the frame. Asymmetrical makes you do that. The rule of thirds divides that into some areas, whether it's top to bottom, right to left, left. Um, it makes you study the frame. So the rule of thirds is simply to aim uh, an imbalance in the image for the viewer, and it also creates that visual tension. But you've got to have something to correct that visual tension. So that's why you've got to use all of those thirds in there. So this is a, I can't really see you. Let me see if I can get rid of these guys. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's see. Can I remove them? Let's see. Nope, oh, nope. Don't want to do that. Oh, there we go. There we go. That'll work. Yeah, those are those are my images there. So this is the Miller House in uh, the and what I'm trying to simply do is, you know, I've I've put that the the house in the foreground, the mountains in the middle, and then the sky in the background. How do you decide your rule of thirds? What should be in there? If there's no interest in the sky, you want to minimize that. And I don't always do the rule of thirds. I'll do the rule of seven tenths, the rule of nine tenths. Wherever the strongest part of the composition is going to be is going to be the dominant part of my image. And everything else just is simply there to, to complement it, so to speak. Do this again. Yeah. So just... That looks terrible. Um, so just a, a quick thing, you know, for the gear as a photographer, especially a landscape photographer, you obviously need a camera and a lens. Doesn't matter what kind you've got. Whatever feels best in your hand is the best camera to get. Because people always say, well, this camera is better than that camera. The camera could be the best in the world. But if it doesn't feel good in your hands, you're never going to pick it up. It's like a golf club in me. I don't own golf clubs because I don't feel comfortable holding golf clubs. Um, I use a tripod for almost all the stuff that I do. Why? Because a lot of times I'm doing images where I'm blending stuff together for exposure. I don't blend for focus, but I blend for exposure. So I need those to match up perfectly. Um, I use a wireless remote because the less I touch my camera, the better. And then I do use filters, primarily circular polarizers. Um, and we'll talk about that at some point. I'm getting ready to push this button. It's going to do nothing. Uh, da, 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 there we go. So you need a wide variety of lenses or you need a nice complement of lenses. So look at me. Here. So I carry everything for like a, a trip that I went to the Tetons, um, going to Iceland. I carry something that's wide angle, typically a zoom. That's a middle range, 28 to 75. And then I carry a short telephoto typically, a 50 to 400 or a 150 to 500. I do a lot of my landscape work with telephoto lenses. I tend to either stay on the wide side or I tend to stay on the narrow side. And it's simply the desired effect that I'm trying to do for my vision. Um, if you were, most of you guys are close to my age, probably fairly close. Um, if you remember the magazine, Arizona Highways, it's still out there. There was a photographer, David Munch, um, who used uh, ultra wide angle lenses. He would jam them down into his subject in the foreground and you'd see this big, huge cactus. Then you see these beautiful mesas behind it. 
that really has had a major influence in my photography because that's what got me geared towards doing asymmetrical compositions. That cactus wasn't a subject, the mountains behind it were. So for me, I do a lot of wide angle and whenever I'm using a wide angle lens, it's always going to be asymmetrical. Um, and we're gonna see some examples of that. Um, golly, the quality of those are horrible. Um, no, that's all pixelated. Yeah, but it shouldn't be because it's going straight to this. There's, let me see. Um, da, 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 da. All right. If we, um, where's that? Well, where's the list of the, uh, the, the program or the, the images? Oh, it's the same. Horrible. Yeah. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's there may be two different image sets of images on there. So let me see. No, that's not what we want. It's kind of there. Uh, no, that's not what you're Oh, I know what you're I know what you're after. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to find like the I got the, the folders and come on, I'll see. That be a different program that's on. That's the we use the fifth on Open with best on. Let's do this. The photos is what we were using. Okay. But that's what we were using. And which one makes it big here? Um, you gotta drag it down. And then the second hit. Yeah, that's better. The same one we were using. Um, when sometimes when you when you convert from um, Macintosh, you know, Macs to oh, PCs, yeah. there's they create a second folder sometimes, and I think it's the second folder. Oh. So, so anyway, asymmetrical compositions. Um, if you notice what I've done is I've simply taken a, a set of flowers in the foreground, I've jammed my lens fairly close, and then you've just got this beautiful light on the mountains in the background. So the subject isn't necessarily the flowers, the subject is supposed to be the mountains, but they complement each other. What you're doing is you're bringing a lot of stuff into one image, and that's what I'm trying to do with, with the images that I do. And let's see, this is... Uh, in Iceland, this is uh, Vesterhorn, and there's these big sand dunes that are there, and then there's grass growing on top of it, and it's just kind of really neat to grab those in the foreground and then show the stuff that's in the background as well. Okay. Go back to this one. So what I'm doing again is a wide angle lens, um, just jamming it down into that sand. I typically never use a UV filter or a clear filter. When you're in Iceland and you're photographing on the beaches, you always want to use some type of a filter on the front of your lens because the winds are what makes it cold over there. And the wind blowing the sand will literally strip that multi-coating off the front of your lens. So you want to take precautions when you're photographing over there for something like that. But again, this is asymmetrical, just a wide angle lens. Um, with the, the foreground and then the background there. So one thing that I try to really to talk about or I try to convey is, and probably everybody in here has noticed, as you're, as you're learning photography, you have these rapid growth sessions, and then you hit a plateau, and you stay at that plateau a little bit, and you're, you try to, you get frustrated because you want to start going beyond that point. And one of the things that, that, the best thing to do is compare yourself to yourself a year ago. Never compare yourself to another photographer because they're going to be somewhere on their journey that's a lot different from where you're at. But some of the things that I try to teach are attention to detail. That's one of those things that will really take you to that next level. So when you look at, for instance, on this image, I've separated this fern. This fern is five feet around I'm using a 17 millimeter lens. I've made sure that you've got separation between the fern itself and the ferns in the background. 
And the reason that I do that is because I don't want that convergence of elements. I want you to have to step around it or step through the frame. And if they were touching, there's not a clear path visually for you to go from that fern to those birch trees in the background. So start paying attention to elements within your frame to make sure that they don't merge with each other. And I'll try to point these out in, on several of the images that we do. Now, the opposite of being asymmetrical is symmetrical, where it's balanced top to bottom, left to right. And that's where a lot of reflections come in. A lot of times when you see photographs of sunflowers, sunflowers right in the middle, and that's where it's leading you to the center. So that is the, the difference in the two images. There's a distinct subject with symmetrical. With an asymmetrical, you're forced to study the frame and find points of interest that you're looking for. So a standard lens, these others were wide angle, just a standard lens, which is considered 50 millimeters and 35 millimeter standards, 35 millimeter in crop sensor, um, what is an 80 millimeter in medium format um, is considered a standard lens. Uh, this was down in Apalachicola. This was after Hurricane Matthew. And I just really liked the backlighting on this flag. And, you know, I, I wasn't worried about other elements within the frame. I wanted the focus to be on just this. So a standard lens is perfect because there was a lot of interest in other stuff that was there. Hey, David. Same thing here. David, just sorry, to sorry, to yes. sorry to interrupt. Those of us at home are still stuck on the pixelated image of the sunflowers with the Tetons in the back. Oh. oh, boy, you've missed some good stuff then. Yes. Um, Mr. Zoom? So I'm bringing in the technical experts. Have you tried just closing out the presentation and then reopening oh, it? Here we go. We're going to do a new share. How about that? Yeah. Is that better? What do you guys see now? A boat on a lake, and it's perfect. That's okay. Oh, that's it. All that's right. It. I'm glad I could help. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you looked at it and it worked. Boy, the best, the best five images in the presentation were the last five. I don't know what to tell you guys. So, so that's this right. is down in a. We can see them at the bottom of the screen. Oh, okay. Well, that's no fair. Um, so you know, I'm lying then. So. This is uh, um, down in Apalachicola, a little area called Two Mile. And again, there's there was no interesting things in the foreground. The sky was okay, but everything was really the boat. So again, a standard lens. What I'm typically seeing is what I'm going for in an image like this. And make me go over here. There we go. So this is a little rock that's kind of famous out in Utah. It's Delicate Arch. Um, and again, a standard lens is, is that's why zoom lenses are, are really my, my preference nowadays. Um, back when I got into this, I used to carry a bag that had everything from 20 millimeters, 24, 28, 35, 50, 70s. And I mean, I would carry all the way up to 400 millimeter lenses. My bag was literally 70 pounds. And a lot of times I would spend hiking through the Rockies and carrying a 70 pound bag plus food, plus tents, plus sleeping bags. And I don't do that anymore. My bag now is less than 20 pounds and I stay in hotels. So it works out kind of nice. So landscapes with a telephoto lens. Now a telephoto lens, let me start with a, a wide angle. Wide angle lenses have the impression that it decompresses a scene. It can play with your mind because you know that cactus that can be really little, those flowers in the foreground of that one image. So you've got these flowers in the foreground. Those flowers are only about it looks substantially larger. So the decompression of the wide angle lens, the opposite holds true with the telephoto lens. It distorts the images to make them look closer in size to each other. And a prime example of that is this image from St. George Island of the lighthouse. Um, a lot of work in photo pills to calculate exactly when I could get down to the lighthouse and line up the full moon behind it. And I just sat there with a 600 millimeter lens, waited till it got to the right point. It's one exposure, it's not blended together. I exposed for the moon and there was just enough light from some street lights that lit up the lighthouse in the foreground. 
And this is off of a boat in Resurrection Bay. This is a place called Spire Cove. And again, what, what I like to do with telephoto lenses is I like to give you a sense of place. So here, these, these you see the big cliff faces behind it. Um, and I'm just simply trying to show some of the atmosphere that's around or the environment that's around these spires. Um, and it just gives you the impression that they're fairly close together. The versatility of an all-in-one lens. So one night several years ago, uh, this was with a 16 to 300. Um, we were set up to do sunset at Oxbow Bend. And if you look, you can see the sky is really starting to light up nicely. And I was hoping to get a nice calm reflection, that beautiful red reflecting off of the water. You can see the wind didn't cooperate with me. But for about maybe 30 seconds, no more than 45, something happened that if you didn't have an all-in-one, you weren't going to capture this image. So the light came up and pay attention to this little area. I'm going to write a point there. Pay attention to this little area right here, going from 16 to 300 very, very quickly. That's what you get. So if you'd have had to have changed lenses, A, if you could do it in 30 seconds, you're better than I am for sure. Um, you would have missed this image. So I love carrying a 28-200, a 16-300, 16-400, whatever the case may be, um, because you don't miss scenes like this. Um, another image, this was at the Hasita Head Lighthouse um, on the Oregon coast. And just this beautiful fog was, was really emphasizing the light at the lighthouse. And you figured out where they get their name. But simply zooming in a little bit, all of a sudden I could give the isolation of that point. So that all in one, it sort of helps you change your vision as the conditions change. So this is Ossobal Island. We started doing shops down in Ossobal this past February. We'll do our next one next March. Um, this is called Boneyard Beach. So how many people have been to Jackal and been to Driftwood Beach? It's pretty cool, isn't it? Imagine Driftwood Beach for a mile. That's what the word beach is. So you get all these beautiful trees, beautiful um, reflections. We photograph at night and do the night skies as well. Uh, simply taking this and then zooming in to where I isolated one part of that scene. So if I go back and show you the difference in the two, the mood that it creates are two separate things completely. So it makes you, you know, really start to think differently. And that lens selection can really create or emphasize the vision and the mood of the photographer when you're doing those images. So elements and leading lines. Um, if you guys remember, there was photographer Jeff Woodley passed away a couple of years ago. Jeff, Jeff was one of my original students back in the 90s. And Jeff hated this image, absolutely hated it, because I used to tell people, this is a barn in the Tetons. This is John Moulton barn. He says, no, that's a fence post in front of a barn. And I said, well, then I accomplished what I was trying to do because I want you to notice that fence post first. Then I want those lines from the rails, the buck rails, to take you back to that, that barn. So all of it works together. And I think if just the barn had been there, it would have been lacking in the composition. So I think all this stuff is, you have to look at visually the relationship of the things that are in your frame. Now, bear in mind, we see with a standard lens in our vision. So a lot of times before I'll even set up a tripod, I'll put on a wide angle lens or I'll put on a telephoto lens and I move around to see what effect those lens widths are going to have on the elements within that image. And in this one, this is a 10 millimeter lens on a crop sensor, so it would have been 15 millimeters. You know, it, it really, this post is probably six feet tall, but it dominates and it looks like it's 10 feet tall in front of the barn. So it's important to, to know what effect it's going to do. Uh, this is famous Sparks Lane up in the in Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Um, and this image can't be done like this again because the tree on the left, those branches, some of them have broken off. So, you know, it's kind of interesting to look at, at pictures that I've done or images that I've done over the years, and you start to notice some of the changes, dead trees and how some of the things this year in the Tetons, when we actually photographed it, one of the uh, smaller uh, peaks right by the Grand had actually collapsed. So I was going back to look at some of the images that I did last May versus this May, and you can see the difference in the two. 
So White Sands National Monument, this is what leading lines are all about. You know, the lines in the foreground lead you up to the ridge of the sand dunes, then the sand dune takes you off into the distance. A lot of times when I'm doing images like this, I don't want you to know where you're going to end up. I want that mystery, you know, that when you're looking at it, it's carrying you to some place and you can imagine something that's there. Um, if you're in White Sands National, uh, I guess it's a park now. Yeah, so White Sands National Park. Um, if you were to just wander off into the sand, the place you're going to get is lost. So I always tell people that that when you're out there, number one, have GPS or on your phone, mark where your car is at. Uh, secondly, they have little flags and stuff that are out there. Make sure that you know where you've come from, because when you get to where you're going, you may not find your way back. It's very, very big out there. So what's my leading line here? That little path, exactly. It doesn't have to be tricky. You know, I, I like to look at it, and I'm not saying that I attract simple viewers. It's just that my vision tends to be very simple and uncomplicated. Um, and in this case, what I did at the very end of this, the Jessup Path in Sertamont in uh, Cadia National Park, I took a radio filter at the very end, and I, I took some Gaussian blur, and I blurred the end of the path because I don't want you to know what's down there. I want you to go there. And the way that you get them to go there is you leave that question mark in your in your elements and everything else that you're doing. This is up at Dick's Creek, up uh, above the lawn. This is where I go to test it. So if you ever see me there, I'm testing a new lens. Maybe you're not supposed to see the lens, but that's what I'm doing there. So, and again, with this, just simply have this log in the foreground that carries you up then this carries you over, then you can carry it all the way to the side. And again, it's obvious what we're going to end up at. I want you to, I want you to enjoy the scene as I'm doing it as well. Um, this is in one of the slot canyons in uh, Page, Arizona. Um, if you ever go over there, you can get very frustrated going to the Antelope Canyons, to lower upper Antelope Canyon, especially now because it's very expensive to go in. Um, if you pay the extra money to do a tripod trip or a tripod tour, you walk up, they say, okay, you've got five minutes. And you set up five minutes later, they're pushing you through. Um, for almost the same amount of money, maybe a little bit more, you can hire private guides and go to private slot canyons. There's a place called Secret Canyon. Um, it's not too secret because they have advertisements. Um, but the Navajo guide that was with us said, you know, you know what would really look good on that shelf right there is a tumbleweed. And I was like, well, you know, we really don't move stuff. He goes, well, I do. And he put the tumbleweed up there. We did the images and he took it down. So, but I really liked how all of these lines lead you over into the tumbleweed. And then the light that was just natural light lit up that tumbleweed. So everything carries you to that point. And you're going to notice some things. My placement of subjects a lot of times, oops. Better do it up here. Um, I have a pointer that you can point at the screen. It actually shows up there. Um, you're going to start to notice that in that rule of thirds, there's things called PowerPoints. It's the intersections of that tic-tac-toe board. You're going to notice that a lot of the elements that I have in my images are in those PowerPoints. And that's very, very important because we're going to talk about that in a minute as well. Uh, this is down at Driftwood Beach. And I searched high and low to find and to me it really just it balances the image because so often you see photographs of the tree but you don't see enough to carry you to that tree so with this i found a log in the foreground and it carried you up the hardest part about this image were the biting gnats and by the way if you ever go to the coast and you're getting bit up a lot of people say you skin so soft i think george you were were you here when we revealed the um, the Victoria's Secret. Oh, no, no, I, I don't do Victoria's Secret. No, no, so no. We, we learned down in Osceola <laughs> Island, the, the sand fleas, sand gnats, whatever you want to call them, the biting teeth, they, they treated skin so soft like teriyaki glaze. Mm -hmm. They just ate you alive. But the guy who was down there with us smelled great, number one, but he wasn't getting bit. And so we said to him, you know, what is the secret? And he said, Victoria's Secret Amber Romance. <laughs> Best stuff in the world. Yeah. 
<laughs> They're going to smell like a 13 year old going to a prom, but trust me, the sand fleas will leave you alone. The gnats leave you alone. You have to reapply it about every 25 minutes. But I mean, I have had it on and they just do not touch you. So, you know, I shop at Victoria's Secret, I have to admit. Run. So I carry a camera with me everywhere I go. And my wife and I volunteer at a, a therapeutic riding center in Jasper. And we were out one night feeding the horses. We feed them every Saturday night. And a thunderstorm came through. And as the storm passed over, there was this double rainbow. And here was this horse in the foreground. And I was like, I really need to get this horse under the double rainbow. So I laid down in the horse poop and I got my image, but I think it's worth it. Well worth it. So the elements are the horse and then the rainbow. This is at Gibbs Garden. Um, during COVID, you didn't get to go out the normal way. You had to go the little back way. And in the spring, I noticed all the cherry trees just were beautiful. And so I, I composed the image to have that road just meander. And if you ever go to Gibbs, if, you, if you've never been, you should go. But you'll notice that there are no straight lines at Gibbs Garden. And that's by design. Um, he likes you to meander through his gardens. And the way you meander is, is not focus on a straight line, but a curved path. And he and I have spent a lot of time, I'm one of their official photographers there. Um, he and I have spent a lot of time talking about, you know, photography composition versus designing gardens. And it's very, very similar to what you're doing. Um, and it's, it's really interesting listening to his philosophy. And then I start to talk about the photography side of it. And, you know, he started laughing, saying, really, we're thinking the same thing. And I said, you know, that, that Gibbs really is a photographer's dream when it comes to composition, because you do just meander visually as well as physically through the garden. So a minute ago, I talked about that rule of thirds. Um, I've never seen the study, but supposedly years ago, Kodak did a study that said that because in the Western culture, we read left to right, the most powerful PowerPoints when you're looking was either the upper left or the lower right. So if you're going to place an element in one of those spots where those tic-tac-toe boards come together, you want to place it in the either the upper left or lower right. Because visually, as we're reading, like in a book, that's where our, our vision is going to take us. So it's a little bit of an experiment. Um, and this, it's tough because there's other stuff that's around the tree that will get your attention. But this is placing it in the lower left. That's placing it in the center. And that's placing it in the, in the lower right. If you were to get rid of these, I think that would be the strongest composition. Because, again, your vision takes you down to that point. So sort of, and if, if it doesn't work, that there's no way to place it there, and you have to place it in the lower left, guess what you can do? Flip it in Photoshop. Absolutely. The only rule in photography is, is lie. If you do some manipulation, always be honest about it. If it's a composite, tell people. There's nothing wrong with doing those things. The, the problem is, is when you don't, when you aren't honest about them. Um, I knew, I've known many photographers that have done composites, that have removed things from frames, National Geographic photographers that lost their jobs because they lied about removing something from a frame. There's one photographer that put the Milky Way from the Northern Hemisphere into images of the Southern Hemisphere and then tried to lie about it. She's never going to work for National Geographic again. You know, there's a lot of photographers that do that. So another example, this is in Hyatt Lane in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Now, there's two things that I want you to take from this, the placement of yourself on the road, but I want you to pay attention, especially up here to where the road is at. You see how there's just a slither of a road that's there and it's it's almost, you know, not that. So if I move to the left a little bit, did I, did I do it? Let's see. Yes. So if I go to the left, a little bit, you start to see more of the road. But now in the foreground, there's nothing that distinctly gets you to go in that direction. Visually, you have to step to the side. So if I step a little bit more to the left, now I've got a clear path that leads me all the way down the road. There's nothing that's obstructing it, because even in this one, 
just the slightest amount of obstruction takes you away from that. So here, I've got the grass path that is distinctly telling me to go straight ahead. I've got the fences that are there. I've got the gravel road. And I've got a clear path to go when I get to the end. So those are the little things that you can do, that attention to detail, that will take you to that next level of photography. Um, this is the famous little John Moran, the one that you saw on the snow. Uh, this was this past year. And what I'm doing here is just simply using a long lens to compress that scene together and trying to repeat the pattern of the peak of the barn, the peak of the mountain behind it. So just little things, just trying to pick those out. All right, hopefully they can still hear me. So this is the typical image that people do. And I always, when we do our workshops, wherever we go, first of all, I want you to get a wall hanger. I want you to get something that you're happy with, even if it is that iconic image. And this is one of those iconic images from the Tetons. But I also want you to expand your, your visual horizon as you get there and start to look at some of the non-obvious things. And this particular morning that we did this, there was nobody there. But another time that we went, there was probably 50 or 60 people. So we moved back up the road a little bit. And I've never photographed at this tree before, but I really liked the effect Please of- Please share your screen. Um, let's see. Those of us at Hall have completely lost the image. All right. All I see is Mike. Should I be seeing your oh, stuff? I'm going to really glare. Do, 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 do. And well. Can you still see Mike? Can you see Stan? Yeah. Okay. What do you guys see now? Right now it's hung up. No, no image. It says Mike Sussman has started. <laughs> The connection is unstable again. So it's being recorded to the well, it's being recorded, so hopefully we'll catch it. So because of so many people in front of the barn, we moved up the road, and I've never photographed with this cottonwood before, but I started noticing how it gave it a totally different perspective. And it made it really neat um, because I'd never photographed it before. It was in, in, and once I did it's being around, I noticed that moving a little bit to the left, I could also get the mountains into the frame. Whereas the image before, the mountains were over here behind the tree. So moving to the left, I was able to get a barn and I was able to get the mountains and I was able to get a tree still. And I really liked that. And waited a little bit, the fog moved in, and I think it gave it even a, a really cool effect as well. Then I decided just to take the boring completely out of it and do just the tree and the mountain, move back a little bit, use a wider angle lens, and, and got the entire image in there. there we go. Let's see. So let me see something here. What is my next one? Gotta get my train of thought here as to what's there. So again, talking about iconic images, one of those iconic images is Schwabacher Landing. And typically it used to be that when you went to put size, size was a secondary 
o'clock in the morning. And what time did we leave in, in the morning this time? 4.30. 4.30, yes, we did. We were the first ones there, were we not? And it was kind of neat because we had the whole thing to ourselves. I've noticed that over the years, um, because of beaver dams and everything that are there, it's opened up the opportunities to photograph. This used to be the only image that you could get. So you would have 80 to 100 people lined up fighting for a position to get this image. But now there's other places. So once our group got the iconic image at Swamp Landing at the Beaver Pond, we came back towards the Okay. We'll just give away another car since they can't hear us. This is also from the parking lot. So realistically now, this is becoming a, a more iconic image than the other one because the trees have grown up. It's very, very isolated. Whereas here, you've got a much wider space. And I don't know if it was on the... Just on the side of the river from us. It was this big frame, but it was still a moose. Mm -hmm. So, well, at the time we all had wide angles and we were like, well, but there was no way to get the moose and the mountains in there. So, we just deal with it on that one. Let's see. So, a lot of times here in competitions, um, Negative space. The judge says, oh, there's too much negative space. There's negative space. I'm going to be honest. I live in negative space because I have, I believe in simplified compositions. And the less distractions that you have, the stronger the image is to me because there's no question at what you're looking for. And so I use negative space all the time in my images. It's only negative if it's not doing something positive. So keep that in mind. So if it's distracting from your subject, then it's negative. But if it leads you to your subject or it's part of the subject, then, then it's not negative. It's, it's a positive. Repetition. I try to find things in my foreground that I can line up to something behind it, and it gives a repetition all the way through the frame. And you'll see that here. There's a place called the Patriarch Tree. We didn't get to visit it this this year. Um, it's not an easy place to get to. It's about a mile walk from the road. Very few people know where this tree is at. Um, it's not on any maps. It's not marked anywhere. Um, you just simply have to know where the tree is to find it. But I really liked how the repetition of the pine in the foreground also lined up with the background. And then these little trees sort of represented the mountains behind it as well. So I'm carrying that repetition through. I'm, I'm getting the viewer to visually travel through the frame. Uh, I thought this was this Cadillac Mountain in Acadia National Park. I liked how this was the mirror opposite of the tree above it. So it sort of carries you through the frame again. So the repetition, almost a mirror-like reflection. So simple images, this is a lot of the stuff that I was referring to. If you notice, I purposely moved to a point of separation between this tree in the foreground and the trees in the background, because I want you to visually have a distance between the two. You know, back and without visions, there's still a path to go through. What you don't see in this image is to the right and to the left are houses. You know, just using the right lens, moving back to the telephoto lens. Uh, this is in Holly, um, Iceland, and it's just this beautiful yellow house that's there. Um, I did manipulate it a little bit. There's a was a sign in the window right here that said something like, to rent this place, call this number. Um, I took that out of the image because I didn't want people to, to rent my, my getaway. <laughs> so is there any negative space in this image? 
but it's cool, isn't it? I mean, it's it's like it's just this one tree. I mean, this is one of those inspirational posters, you know, perseverance or something like that. But to me, what makes this image is is everything is whited out except for that one tree. So simplifying a composition. <laughs> that was in in uh, Grovant in the uh, Tetons. So in this one. Um, I was simply trying to, to capture that blue band of light is what's referred to as the earth shadow. So as the sun is rising, that shadow gets shorter and shorter and shorter. When it disappears, the sun has risen. So what I'm simply doing is using the shadow of the earth and the atmosphere. I wanted to capture that color. And I want to get this. These tables are here. So maybe, maybe 10 feet by eight feet. And it was just a tidal pool, and I'm laying down right at the edge of it with an extremely wide angle lens. I was set up, I was ready to go, and then this guy walked up. <laughs> and at first I was upset, but then I was like, actually, that's kind of cool because it really sort of distorts the image. Now, he realized he saw me over there. First, he thought I had drowned and washed up on shore. And he came over to check on me, and I told him no, I was okay. And he goes, I didn't realize it was in your frame. I said, Actually, you add something to the image. If you'll do me a favor, go over there and just stand real still because it was like a 10 second exposure. So after I messed with the guy for like three minutes of getting him to stand just like this, you know, I told him that I was already finished the image before that. But how far away do you think he is? Because on this image, I'm using a 10 millimeter lens. He's from me to you away. He's that close, but I'm I'm pointing the camera down, so it made him look like he's way off in the distance. Ten millimeter. Mm -hmm. No. So the the thing with it, every lens now has a profile inside of Lightroom or in Photoshop. So if you go to those panels and you see where it says. Uh, lens profiles or lens corrections and stuff. You can click on that and it takes away that distortion typically that you would normally get. So as, as a friend of mine at Tamron says, there's no such thing as a perfect lens, but there's perfect processing to every lens now. Um, DxO Mark is a website that rates lenses. Um, they're the ones that all these manufacturers supply them with the lenses. They do the lens profiles and they supply it to Adobe. So cityscapes, you know, including things into your frame to give it a sense of place, but also to record traveling. This is the St. Louis Arch. Um, this is a 15 millimeter lens and I'm laying on the ground underneath the arch. And I wanted to make sure I captured the, the St. Louis skyline and then the arch itself. This is the bridge in, in Brooklyn. would be. Um, the, the Brooklyn, what is that called over there? I don't like New York, so I don't remember the name of places real well. But from Manhattan, I think they call it Brooklyn Bridge Park, is what it's called. So this is one image with it. And if you if you notice, there's some starburst. The way you get a starburst is you get a single point source of light, and then you stop your lens down to like F16, F22. Now, that's how you get the sun star. But if you notice the spires that are inside of that sun star, the way that you maximize those spires is to pay attention to the number of aperture blades in your lens. If you're using eight bladed lenses, you're going to have eight spires. So you would naturally think that this has got to be like 18 spires or 18 blades, but it's only nine. What happens is, is as the light diffracts, the spires are doubled because it reflects off the, the sensor and goes back out or through the lens. In even number, they reflect back onto themselves, where an odd number of between existing ones. So odd number of lens blades, aperture blades, are going to give you more spires than a sun star. How do you find out how many spire or how many blades you have in your lens? You read the side of your box. So this is the other side of the bridge looking at Manhattan. So I'm not sure what the name of that park is. I thought it was Brooklyn Bridge Park. I'm not sure. I know I'm wrong, but. So when you're looking at composition and you're looking at a landscape and you want to tell a story with wildlife, it's great to incorporate that wildlife into your landscape photography. And 
compositionally is very easy to do. You just simply find something that gives a sense of place. Um, so this is in Resurrection Bay, and this pot of orcas was swimming on the boat. And I wanted to, I did some images close up of the orcas, but I wanted to show the environment that they're in, this, this great area. So I made sure that I just simply zoomed out. I used a wider angle lens, got the orcas in the foreground, got the rocks and the trees and everything behind it. And the birds, of course, just being in there really sort of made a, a nice little touch to it. Um, this is in Chinitna Bay. Um, in Lake Clark National Park. And this is about an 800 pound bear, but I wanted to show the environment that the bear lives in. Um, this is at about 11.30, 11.45 at night. And this is in one June, about two years ago. But the rim lighting really came out sort of cool. So if you ask yourself, is it, a, is it a wildlife shot or is it a landscape shot? It's both because the composition puts it in there and it gives you a sense of place. Nightscapes. Just going to go through these pretty quick. Um, if you, how many people do nightscapes? How many people want to do nightscapes? Just a basic formula to go from. Um, put your camera in manual mode, manual focus. Do 30 seconds to start, ISO 3200, and the widest aperture that your, your lens has. And then if it's too bright, you can simply reduce your ISO or speed up your shutter speed a little bit. Manually focus, if you're using mirrorless, it's easier. You just zoom in on your LCD until you get one of those stars nice and sharp and focus. This is, whenever I'm doing presentations up north, people look at me funny because this is turret arch, okay? Up north, they think I'm saying turd arch, <laughs> but it's turret arch, so I always have to spell it out for them up north. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So where that shrimp boat was at earlier in two mile in, in Apalachicola, this is uh, just simply looking the other way at night. Um, I love photographing night skies in the fall because the, the, the galactic core is visible earlier. Staying up till one or two or three in the morning. And it's always in the southern sky at point in time. So just after the sun is set, as it's dark enough to see, you get that galactic core. You're in bed by 10 o'clock if you want. Um, this is back out at Arches National Park, Balanced Rock. And did anybody know about the Donna Kay down in, in Cape Sandblast? It's all cut up now. They've taken the boat off of the, the beach. But when it was there, we did a workshop all the time in, in November down there. Uh, perfect time. The galactic core was visible probably for the first 30, sec uh, 30 minutes of, of darkness. Um, this was in a full moon, so we're not light painting the boat. The full moon is actually lighting the boat up for us. And placing placing the, the galactic core to where it met a tree, so it sort of gives you composition. You know, There's nothing saying you can't use compositional elements when you're doing night skies. It actually adds to the image. This is down at uh, Triftwood Beach. So how many people want to do this for a living or make some money at it? Don't do it for a living. So you'll find that pretty picture, but you've got to give someone a reason to buy that image. And I still sell a lot of images, but I usually sell them along with some type of an article that I've written. Because if you could do the editor's job for him or her, it makes it a lot easier because if they've got an article, they have to go find the images. If they've got images, they've got to find an article. But if you supply both of them, it's more likely you're going to get the business. I still have a really good relationship with all the art directors that I used, you know, that used me for my, their work 20, 30, you know, almost 40 years ago now. So they still contact me for regular stuff. Um, and one thing that all of them is to have a person in your image. This was Arches National Park two years ago. Um, Cecil Holmes, my teaching partner, and I, we got up at 5 o'clock in the morning to get out of the sledge. Sunrise was at like 8 o'clock. We hiked all the way out there, got up in the sledge. This was the image we were looking for. But right before sunrise, 400 people showed up. <laughs> so we had all these people in the frame. I was so frustrated. But then right when the light hit the arch, turret arch behind it, everybody left. So we got this beautiful image. But then one person walked out there and stood. 
and got this great <laughs> silhouette. She did this and then she apologized to us. I was like, no, 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 do that again, but stand really still. So after she did it, I yelled and got her email address and I sent her a, you know, a copy of this image. Um, whenever you do something like that, people love to see themselves in images. If they're going to get up and they're going to pose like that, they want an image of themselves. So I just yelled, she sent me her info, I sent her the image. Um, the place that we do our, our workshops in Wyoming is a place called Triangle X Ranch in Moose, Wyoming. And I've been associated with them now for almost 15, 16 years. And they hired me a couple of years ago during COVID to come out and do their brochure. And so what it meant is doing pretty pictures with people in it, because we wanted people to picture them being on those horses, riding those horses in front of the mountains. We wanted them to feel like they were the ones in the raft, rafting down the river. Um, with this image, I'm gonna I'm gonna go behind it and a guy that me a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and he get the position that I could line up the boat perfectly with the light and everything behind it. It helps to have that in the background. That really makes it easy. And this is the uh, the the lodge at the ranch. Um, there's another image that they used. Again, you when you're doing something for a client, they typically want someone to buy your product. In this case, it's the ranch. Um, you've got to give someone enticement to go there. And that's what I'll try to do with all these. ICM, do you guys know what ICMs are? Intentional camera movement. It's when you forget your tripod and you have to hand hold and you haven't had your cup of coffee for the day. So it's just basically is, is moving with lines in your frame. So these are aspen trees in, in uh, Wyoming and just simply moving the camera up and down just a half an inch, quarter of an inch and doing like a one second exposure and you just get these lines and it really just makes things a little bit different. When I was an illustrator and, and a painter, Monet, I love the impressionistic period. I loved it um, because again, it made you think about what you were looking at. And so I've always tried to carry that over into the images when I'm photographing. And so I always play with them. So we're going to take a look at just some pretty pictures. And a lot of times, if you place your elements in the right place, if you use your leading lines, you do everything right, it still cannot be that great image. Light can make a difference. And, you know, sort of the similarities of painting versus photography. You know, I guarantee when Michelangelo, I think he, he did the Sistine Chapel, right? Yeah, yeah. You can tell I didn't pay attention in art history. Um, I guarantee he didn't get one of his guys to you know, run down to Walmart and get the cheapest paints he could find. You know, he used good paints. So when we're photographing, let's use good light. So the better the light, the better the images can be. So this is first light at Acadia National Park in Pebble Beach, or Boulder Beach, excuse me. And again, just that nice contrasty light. I love contrast. With with digital photography, a lot of times people using that shadows, opening up the shadows a lot. Um, I tend to bring them down a little bit because I want contrast. I want darkness. I want light. I'll control my highlights, but I don't care if those shadows go dark because that contrast is very very important to me. This is up at Cloudland Canyon. Um, if you notice, there's some separation between the rock and the waterfall, and it's just simply raising that tripod up just enough to make sure that I've got that space between the two, because if that merger had been there, it would have been a distraction versus an element working with the other. This is last light at Horseshoe, uh, Dead Horse State Park in Oregon. I don't remember. There's so many horseshoes, and yeah, this is just one of the mesas. Um, when I was learning photography, I had the best instructors in the world. I mean, for three years, I traveled with John Shaw. And I know. And when I see an image like this, or when I'm waiting for an image like this, my first thing is, is you know, how would art approach this? And again, it's simply waiting till that light was just right capturing it in the camera. I do very little work on my computer with my images. I maybe use three sliders and that's it. I try to capture it right in the camera or as close to as right as I can. And then I finish it in my processing. In this image, it's simply bringing my shadows down and getting it so it separates those mesas from the background. 
This is over in Iceland. Do you guys remember a couple of years ago, there was a story about a lady that started to wash out into the ocean. That is the ice she was sitting on right there. Because that's the universe. And like a week after we got back to see the story of a lady sitting on one of these rocks. And when they showed the rock, I was like, or the ice chunk, I was like, we photographed that ice chunk. So I a couple takeaways from that. Her son was videoing the whole thing. A, he's out of the will. He's getting video in as she's floating out to sea. Some random stranger saved it. And two, you have to be really careful because sneaker waves come in and it doesn't look like the water is very deep here, but all of a sudden one big wave can come in that's three feet you know, up to your waist. And if you're not careful, it can sweep you and your camera gear out to sea, or in this case, the guy's mom. So what I really like about Diamond Beach is a slow exposure. You wait till the water comes in as it starts to recede. That's when you do those one second exposures. And it gives you these beautiful white lines because all those lines are is the oxygen in the waves. So when you see a wave crash, you see the bubbles and everything else. As it recedes, those bubbles go out. And that's what this is. It creates those leading lines for you. And you run around the rock and stuff. Same thing there. This is down at uh, Driftwood Beach again in, in Jekyll. So this is an image that you cannot make. Um, probably... For the past maybe 15 years, you couldn't make this image. And the reason being, it's in an area of the Tetons called Pilgrim Creek. And this reservoir fills up, um, the lupine will be blooming, but if you're familiar with that Bear 399, this is where the bears hang out. They didn't used to hang out in this area, but they do, so they close Pilgrim Creek off to all traffic. They didn't used to do that, so this image is probably oh, maybe 15 years, maybe 12, 15 years old before the bears took that area over. But I'd love to get back there again in the spring because when the lup lupine's blooming, obviously it's pretty cool. So ice caves, I love to photograph in ice caves. And George was with us on this trip. A key when you go to Iceland and you're photographing an ice cave, make sure your guide knows metric to imperial conversions. <laughs> We were hiking out and the guide said, you know, we're like, you know, first of all, it's it's pouring down rain, sleet, snow. George stepped into a hole that in a parking lot that was like this deep and just disappeared. Once we got him out, we start going out. And I'm trying to decide what I'm going to take with me out to this ice cave. So our guide's name was Oli. I said, uh, Oli, how far is this to this ice cave? Because I'm, you know, I'm I'm trying to decide what to take out there. He goes, it's it's like three miles round trip or three kilometers round trip. He said, three kilometers round trip. That's great. <laughs> so we get out of our bus. We hike maybe a quarter of a mile. Then he says, okay, you guys need to put on your big crampons. So they're two inches, these big spikes, because we're going to cross the glacier. So we start walking and we're walking and we're walking. I said, Oli, we've gone more than a kilometer and a half. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, we just got a little ways. He goes, Oh, he goes, I meant three miles each way. <laughs> so bear in mind, at this point, I've got 35 pounds of gear and a lot of cuss words in my in my bag at this point in time. And we were absolutely exhausted. But the thing was, it was uphill all the way out. George actually slipped on the ice and started sliding and, and Oli had to save him. But we went up, uphill all the way to the ice cave on the way back. Should be downhill, right? No, it was uphill. <laughs> so don't ask me how that works but we ended up we were on top of this glacier and i'm looking i'm going what is that little white dot down there and i realized that's our van that we still had like a mile to go after we had hiked forever and i had to delete the video because we had a gopro going the whole time but if i'd ever played it on youtube it would have been beep 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 <laughs> you know so i had to had to get rid of that but ice caves are great because the lines, the color, and everything else is just natural. So this this was, uh, the guide we use now is actually a Viking named Thor. So what a better way to go to Iceland. And so Thor says to us, this is the only ice cave that's open in, in Iceland right now that's accessible without having to take a helicopter or four-wheel drive vehicles. Um, 
he said that the crowds are going to leave at about eight o'clock to get to this ice cave. He said, I recommend we leave at seven to beat the crowds. And I said, great, we'll leave at six. So we got out there in time for the sunrise to come up and that light coming through the, the ice cave just was beautiful. It looks like gold actually on the side of the walls. Absolutely beautiful. This is looking the other direction. Beautiful place. This is Mesa Arch. Has anyone been to Mesa Arch? How early did you get up to go to Mesa Arch? First time I got three hours before sunrise. The second time I got 45 minutes before sunrise. Oh, so the thing about Mesa Arch is everybody loves to go there. It's an easy walk, quarter of a mile. But if you don't get there three or four hours beforehand, you're going to share the spot with, you know, 200 of your closest friends most of which don't speak English or don't care that you've been set up for three hours waiting to get this shot. You'll you'll literally be sitting there with your camera on a tripod and you'll see a camera or a phone come in front of you and take the picture. Instead of doing it above your head, they figure you've got the best angle, so they, they do that. This particular day that we were doing this, someone handed me their phone and asked me to do a picture for them. I did it and handed it back, then another phone came over. Another phone. I did like 20 pictures on people's cell phones, but little did they realize that in a few of them, I'd hit reverse on the camera. So they got a picture of me going. <laughs> One of my favorite pastimes, Minnehaha Falls, just a beautiful place. I mean, to me, when I'm photographing Minnehaha Falls, you have to get in the water because, you know, those lines going around you aren't as strong as the lines coming into you. So again, I'm trying to visually lead people through the frame. And that's what composition is, is, is controlling the viewer's uh, vision as they go through. There's an area up in Banff National Park called Mount Rundle. It's on the Vermilion Lakes. And I went there with a wide angle lens and it had snowed the night before. And as the sun was coming up, the wind picked up and the snow was blowing off of Mount Rundle. The sun was coming up behind it. And it looked like it was almost just fire coming off the top of that mountain. And again, just having that long lens with me, I didn't have the all-in-one. I had to use a switch lenses real quick. So I'm a firm believer that once you get your composition, you find the elements that you want, you've got to be patient. You've got to be there and you've got to wait for the light. You may sit for two or three hours waiting for that 10 minutes of glorious light. But to me, it's worth it. This is a, again, this is a place called Pato Lake. It's in Banff National Park. And I really love it because... The lake is also referred to as Wolf Lake. And if you look, oh, yeah. there's an eye. Isn't that cool? And I didn't even add that. That was there. So about 45 minutes later, light hits the mountain. It's a totally different mood from one image to the next. That's what light can do to your image. This is an area called Moraine Lake. So this is a place called the Rock Pile. The Rock Pile is very, very popular. I've been there and there's been 20, 30, 40 people there. This particular day, I got up really early and I hiked up in the dark. Nobody was there. It was great. I set up, I did my images. I waited for that peak light to come down and lit it up beautiful. I hiked back down and I couldn't believe I was the only person in July on the Rock Pile in Moraine Lake. Then I got to the bottom and the sign said, area closed due to grizzly activity. <laughs> This is a uh, Rainus Farja, which is the Black Sand Beach, the famous beach in Iceland. Um, they, the, the dangerous thing about this is, again, sneaker waves. You can be 50 to 100 feet away from the water where it's stopping, and then all of a sudden a big wave will come in and it'll be up to your waist or up to your chest. Um, we have been there and seen camera gear floating out. We've seen people get knocked down, get dragged out. Um, it's a very dangerous place, and people don't pay attention to that. The good thing is having our guide with us, Thor, he's always watching those waves come in, and he knows what's going on, and he yells to us, everybody grab your gear, get back. Um, but this is what the light looks like in the wintertime there. The sun never gets above about 30 degrees on the horizon. So the entire day, you've got this beautiful light. This is probably an hour, hour and a half after sunrise. And I like those basalt rocks in the foreground that I simply silhouetted with a longer lens to get those spires in the background, uh, the sea stacks 
and just get that light that was bouncing off of them between the two. Again, it's just learning what lenses do that will help your compositions. And you don't have to have detail all the way through the image. Um, to me, contrast is the key to a lot of successful compositions as well. And so on our workshops, and I think we have some people that can attest, typically we get to a place and we say, this is what we're looking at. This is how we're going to compose the image. You know, I'll call out a shutter speed. I'll call out an, an f-stop, um, ISO, everything. I'll give you an idea. But this particular morning, I was as giddy as my teaching partner, Cecil, would be in a donut shop. Um, I just knew it was going to be spectacular. When I when we pulled up, I told everyone, I told you guys I would tell you the f-stops and all that. I'm just going to yell them out, and I'll explain why afterwards. And they were like, why? And I said, because this is going to be the most spectacular sunrise you've ever seen in your life. And they really doubted me. But this was what the blue hour looked like. A little while later, this was the first light that hit the mountain peaks and lit the clouds up above it. Literally, in my group, I was having to walk over and push shutter buttons because people were just crying because they were just overwhelmed with the beauty of it. After this hit, they were all like, that was incredible. Let's go. I said, where are you going? It's not over. A couple minutes later, lit up a little bit more. Then a couple minutes later, that cloud inversion lit up. So we had that second sunrise and just became absolute. And again, I probably did 50 or 60 images on other people's cameras because I was just running over as they were crying, just hitting the shutter button, hoping that they had the, the exposure right and everything else. But that was the final image that we ended up with that day. And so I told the group afterwards, this is why I chose F11. This is the shutter speed I was looking at. I wanted to do it you know, a little bit underexposed to get the saturation, get the contrast. And then I said, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is, that was the most spectacular sunrise I've ever seen in my life in the Tetons. And I've been going there since 1976. I said, the bad news is, is this was the first session of a five-day workshop. It's all downhill from here. So, but we actually had some other good stuff. So as a photographer, it's, it's very easy to rest and not really do what you, you tell everybody as an instructor anyway. And I always tell people that regardless of what the conditions look like, the one time that you don't go out is going to be the most spectacular morning that you get. So we were staying in St. George Island. This is over in Scipio Creek in Apalachicola. It was raining cats and dogs. And I woke up and I was like, you know, I could sleep in this morning. I could really use the sleep. So I pulled out my little weather app and I looked and it said, Right around the time sunrise was going to hit, the clouds were going to open up and clear for about five minutes. So I said, I'm, I'm going to have to take my own advice and I'm going to go out and I'm going to see what happens. And up until the very moment that I did this image, it was horrible conditions. But you could see the light starting to peek through. And then when it did, it lit up the sky like this. And I was able to get probably three or four frames. And then I did a quick panoramic, which is what this is to go ahead and get that light. And I, I told myself, you know, I can I can honestly go to my groups now and say, even when I wanted to sleep in, I didn't because I went out and I, I captured something like this. So adverse conditions sometimes make the best shooting conditions. And really there's times that composition really means nothing, it's out the window. This is at a place called Shore Acres, it's in Coos Bay, Oregon. And I was out there doing an out of Chicago event and a couple of us were talking about going down the coast because they were expecting these monster waves to come into the Oregon coast. So Gavin Hardcastle, Nick Page, myself, um, trying to think who else, it was like five of us, drove down the coast to this place. And then these waves started coming in. And as the, the wave would hit the rock, it would go into the air. To give you an idea of how big this wave is, you see those people? Oh, oh no. Those waves are 300 feet high when it crashed into it. Absolutely incredible. Fortunately, I'm like a quarter of a mile away, so I stay dry. I don't know how dry those people stay. <laughs> but isn't that amazing? And this is when I love to use a faster shutter speed to capture the power of the waves hitting. 
Shutter speed has a lot to do with you know that that mood that the image is. This of course is a uh, Snake River Overlook, the famous place that uh, Ansel Adams did that that image, which can't be done anymore because the trees have grown up. So you can't get that solid curve in the in the um, the bend of the snake. So when I was out there a couple of years ago, um, that image that you saw with the riders in front of the mountain. Um, we were getting them saddled up that they were tacking their horses. We were going to go across the road to do that image that you saw. One of the horses let himself out of the corral and took off running. So while everybody is looking for this horse, I was in the car and I found the horse and I phoned up to the guys and said, hey, he's down here. I've got him. They came down and grabbed him as they were going up to get him tacked. I turned around and this is what I saw. Absolutely spectacular. Just, I mean, unbelievable light. Sometimes accidents happen and they turn out really nice. I was able to capture these images. So this is Balanced Rock. There was, there's so many apps that are available now that I really recommend downloading several apps onto your phone. And there was a storm that was coming through Arches National Park. I use a Ventu Sky. Um, uh, photo pills, and I use clear outside. And so all of these apps together were telling me that the storm was going to blow through really quick. It was moving west to east. This was at sunset. And I told the guy that was with me, let's get over to Balanced Rock. Maybe we'll be lucky enough to get a rainbow. We were lucky enough to get a double rainbow. So just beautiful. I love to do panoramics. Typically, I like to set them up on a tripod. This particular light lasted about 40 seconds, and I literally just held the shutter button down as I was panning across the, the horizon there to get that beautiful light. Um, Ossabaw Island. If you love those moody images from the coast, you know, go, go to Savannah, go to Ossabaw Island if you can, go to Cumberland Island. Ossabaw Island is a private island. Um, it's owned by the State uh, Department of Natural Resources now. Um, you can't go onto the island without permission. Um, you can't just go there and go, um, but you can go as high as the tide line. To go any further, you have to with the people from the foundation or the Department of Natural Resources. Um, one of the, you know, my good friends now, and he's probably going to watch the recording if it's not on the, uh, the, the web webinar part of it. I got him, Mark Whitney, retired as the assistant director of the Department of Natural Resources. So two years ago, he said, Hey, let's go check this island out. You really need to see it. So when we were out there, he suggested we contact them about doing workshops out there. And our first two were held this year. We're going to do one next year. But you've got this island that nobody is on except for two people, and then the people from the foundation. Um, the, the road that you see, the Sandy Road, is the longest maintained dirt road in America, I think is what they were telling us. Um, the oldest, the oldest and the longest. So the island's however many years old, and they've never paved it, they've never done anything. Um, but it's just beautiful because you've got all the live oaks that are just over this road for miles and miles and miles. And you get these beautiful images. Gibbs Garden. You know, people get mad at me a lot for the images I share of Gibbs um, because I get to go in before it opens. And so I get this really cool light and I don't ever have people in my pictures. Um, but if you plan it right, you can still get some really neat stuff, even when people are there. Um, and I really wanted to capture the Japanese gardens with the fall colors. And then, of course, throw in a sun star and it makes it even better. But my favorite spot in Gibbs is this one little spot where you've got these natural framing trees. And, and I'm not a big fan of framing images um, with limbs and branches and stuff like that. But this one particular spot, I really do every chance I get. You ever want to photograph your work? Uh, 2024, 2025, be your best chances in our lifetime. Um, solar activity is at, at a high, um, and you won't see that light again. You won't see that activity for possibly 22 to 30 years. Um, so it's a great opportunity. To, if you have the opportunity to go someplace to photograph the northern lights, definitely do it. 
Um, we're taking the group over just to do Northern Lights almost in February back to Iceland. Um, exposing for the Northern Lights, it's easy. It's like doing night skies, but the exposure is about 1600 ISO in about five seconds versus the 30 seconds um, and 3200 ISO. This was done during a full moon, so that's why you've got that foreground lit up as well. Um, how many people have ever seen the Northern Lights? Oh my God, they're just, it's, I mean, the hair in my arms is standing up because it's, it is absolutely just unbelievable to witness. And these lights danced across the skies. The clouds moved in, so we went back to our hotel and the clouds, the lights actually kept performing this side of the clouds. So you saw all the light that's up there. Absolutely incredible. These are just a couple images from the, the recent trip to the Tetons. There's a place called uh, Blacktail Ponds Overlook. Um, I like to go to the iconic spots, but at the same time, I want to take people to places that they can relax, they can set up, they can take their time. They don't have to worry about people walking in front of them uh, because enjoying the Tetons is, is all part of it. Capturing the images to bring home or another thing. Um, but this, I've never had anybody ever in the way of us getting images. And it's a very, very easy place to get to. It's maybe a hundred yard walk, if that. There's a place called, did anybody see the movie Spencer's Mountain years and years and years ago? This movie was filmed. Uh, that is Hedrick's Pond down below. Um, Ranch has the lease to this property, so they ride their horses up there. Um, I have the gate combination, so I can go and unlock the gate and we can go out there. Of course, you have to know how to unlock the lock. Um, we didn't know how to unlock the lock this past time. Because if not, tell me, does this make sense? You've got the lock, the bottom lock. You see a number here, a number in the middle, and then a number below. Which of those three spaces is the combination going to be? If you said the middle, you're wrong. The top was the right one. So we walked out there the first, the first time we did it. And it wasn't that bad of a walk, I guess. But it was still a little bit of a walk. It was uphill, <laughs> but it was downhill coming back. So funny, funny story. The second time we did it with the second group, we're driving out and no one's supposed to be out there. I mean, these are these these areas are closed. And as we're driving out, we see headlights. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, who is out here? You know, they're gonna be surprised when we drive up. So as we drive up, the headlights disappear. I don't think anything of it. And as you're driving down this forest service road, there's a little uh, like a cable that's a gate. We pull up and I'm unlocking the gate and the car that had the headlights is just off to the side. I said, oh, they're probably sleeping. So as I unlock the gate, all of a sudden this girl stands up from behind the bush. That's like 15 feet. And she goes, I had to pee. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, of all the luck, you go in the middle of 10,000 acres down an abandoned road and you find a place that you can go behind a bush and two trucks pull up or two cars pull up. And now you have to stand up and embarrass yourself. I felt bad for her. <laughs> yeah. So this is one of those magical mornings when you've got actually it snowed the night before that we did this image. This is from this past year. This is, uh, it, it amazed me that the parking lot was full of cars, but there was nobody out there photographing. And I have no idea where they, where they were. But it was just so nice to be able to just sit and get these beautiful reflections on Schwabacher Landing. And again, what I did here is a wide angle lens, simply using the grass in the foreground to create my leading line. And then the reflection over there, that's 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 obviously the subject, but this carries you over there to it. What are you using now? 20, 20? Um, on this one, it's, it's probably a 20. So I don't want a full frame camera, so it's an actual 20. Now, you, uh, this past trip, I took the 20 to 40. When I go to Iceland, I'll take the 17 to 28 because some of the waterfalls there are just so big. So a lesson that I learned that I always tell people to do is as you're photographing, always look behind you. And I was guilty of not looking behind me this morning. And we were photographing the beautiful barn with the mountains behind it. And one of the people that worked at the ranch came with us to photograph. And when we started to, to move, in the other direction is photographing this fog with these trees. 
And it made me realize that I'd broken my own rule of not looking behind me because I did this image and then zooming in a little bit, got that image. And then again, was able to do a sun star. And it was something that I had just totally overlooked and not even thought about. So always look behind you doing your sunset or sunrise. So thank you guys. This is all my information here. Do you have any questions for me? I have one, but it's kind of a loaded question. Yes. With the, I can't remember, it's generation feel or generative feel, Photoshop and the AI stuff, does that create like a huge thing in terms of the people being honest because you can completely manipulate it where it's not? So there's some tricks to it. Um, so the short answer is yes, it, it, it does. For the, you guys online, the question was, does all this new AI stuff present problems with honesty and photographers? Honest photographers are always going to be honest. It's the dishonest ones that you have to worry about. So um, it's getting so good, the artificial intelligence, that it's going to be hard to tell. Um, but, I mean, I don't use, I, I use like sharpening, the AI for sharpening and stuff like that, or noise reduction. But the courts have already ruled that if you do something that's AI computer generated, the, uh, the fill. So if I were to say, I'm gonna put a moose in one of my settings, I cannot copyright that image because I didn't make that image. The computer generated a part of that image. So the problem is going to be, it's and it's gonna be a drawn out battle at some point in time in court that um, these photographers are gonna copyright images and then someone's going to be able to tell that it's something computer generated has been added to it and they're going to test photographers. They're going to, you know, purposely, you know, use the image for something and try to get sued because the courts, you know, like I said, they've already ruled that um, if you're adding stuff in, if you're filling in your image with AI, you can't copyright it because you didn't create that image. You can only copyright the actual image itself without adding to it. Um, but yes, it's it's going to be a mess. Um, you know, I look at stuff online now. And it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, it's, you know, the stuff in Photoshop right now being the beta version, um, it, it's not very high resolution, but, you know, you can still tell, but it does a good job. Um, you know, when, when digital photography first started, um, I remember the big discussion was, as nature photographers, what could we do digitally to an image that would alter the actual natural history value of that image because there's two types of nature photographers there's natural uh, history photographers that you're not manipulating the image it's showing an, an animal in its environment or something then there's fine art which you're doing some manipulation you're doing some changes you're taking stuff out of the frame whatever the case may be um, so the question was when you're submitting and i remember submitting stuff digitally at the very beginning of, of all this that I had to submit raw files as well as the finished image so they could see that I didn't take a snow leopard and put it in North Georgia. Um, so, you know, again, I, I think that there's going to be some checks and balances, but you're always going to have dishonest photographers. So, sadly, you know, to me, it's, it's beautiful artwork, but you're not doing it. A computer's doing it. So, you know, who gets the credit? You or Dell? Anything else? Let me see if there's any questions online here. You very nice. Uh, okay, there we go. Nobody's trying to win a car. <laughs> so you'll notice that. I mean, that's... Actually, there's there's so you can go to my website, Bear Woods Photography, and there's a page that says like events and workshops. Um, but they're all done typically, or the majority of them are done with my partner, um, teaching partner Cecil Holmes in Alabama, together we're in nature photography workshops. Now, um, shameless plug. A little group called the Premium Group that for thirty nine ninety five a year or whatever it is, um, you join this group, you get advance notice of two to three days ahead of everybody else about the workshops. Uh, 
But that $39.95 gets you $100 off of any workshop that you sign up. So it pays for itself. Okay. So if you go to that Nature and Focus Photography Workshop page, you'll see where it says uh, join our premium group. Uh, what we do is we give you a topic for the month. Um, we give you an assignment, and then once a month we do critique sessions. We've got all these videos, instructional videos on the page that aren't available to the general public. It's only people in the group. Um, we do some newsletters and some other stuff that, that's in there as well. But yeah, the Nature and Focus is probably the best place. Um, on that premium group, we have a Facebook page, uh, and we post the workshops on that page before we announce them to the general public. And then typically, if you've been to a workshop before, there's a participants group that we have. They get second notification, then we announce it to the general public typically. Well, I used to get your feed on my Facebook page, but for some reason, I don't get them anymore. <laughs> well, I would write Zuckerberg and tell him, you demand to see my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I always have to be careful because I could I could be a, a lifetime offender in the Facebook jail. So I always have to always have to behave. So but yeah, that's that's the best place to go to. But you notice, I mean, I give you personal information on there. On the website, there's a phone number, everything. If you're getting ready to go to some place, send me an email, you know, drop me a message, something. If I've been there, I'll tell you some great spots to go to. Um, like I said, I learned from the best in the world. And one thing that I learned from every one of them is they were very, very open with information. They never kept secrets of places that they photographed. They were always very, very forthcoming. And, and you know, when someone wanted to know something, they would tell them. And I always learned that that if those guys can do it, you know, little old me could do it as well. So, you know, I'll give you, I'll tell you exactly where to stand. I mean, I'll say, you know, go to this place, you'll see tripod marks in, in the sand there. So. 10 years ago, I barely knew David. I'd only met him once and then I knew him online. I was up in Knoxville and I called him and um, then there was a government shutdown. So I couldn't go to Cades Gove. And I said, where can I go? And I don't remember where I went, but you told me, Tremont you gave me some ideas of where I could go yeah. that day. Yeah, it's just, you know, I mean, these, these places, I didn't invent these places. I mean, someone told me about it. So I'm not gonna hold information back from people that, that wanna know. I mean, that's just, that's not who I am. It's not who I've ever been and I'll never be. So, you tell me where the best donut places are at every location. Absolutely. You, you want a good donut? I'm your guy. That's for you, brother. Yeah, that's right. So, we'll I'm going to. After the meeting. <laughs> What's that? So, we'll get together at the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do a tabletop book of the most photographed or the most photogenic places near donut shops. Uh, best seller. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. Appreciate thank it. You. I'm I'm got, through, got through some technical difficulties. I don't know how the internet connection has been throughout this whole thing. I know it's going back and forth. We'll see how the um, how the video goes. But thank you for everybody who stayed and persevered. We're going to go ahead and um, do our uh, monthly presentation. Let's see. The uh, monthly challenge, I mean. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't stay there. <laughs> it going. It's not my laptop tonight. It's the solar activity. <laughs> it's not. So being a miser, I don't have Microsoft Office. Rather, I am using a product called LibreOffice. She got rid of the yellow band. It's all on the wrist, Mike. Okay. There you go, Lisa. You're doing a good job. All right. Continue. So I'll do it. <laughs> so this is our monthly challenge. This month's theme is in motion. And oh, we got ballots. Everybody has a ballot. I believe. Me. Um, anyway. Um, 
And so you vote for three images, the top three. We count the votes for the top five. And the winner at the end of the year with the most points becomes our photographer of the year. You get a new one. Yeah. We can wait for this point. All right. So let me back up here. The theme was in motion. How many images we got? Eight. Eight images. I'll go through them three times. Pick your top three. The email to send your vote to is Bureau Visible here. It'll be again at the end. Hang on. So here we go. Image one. Not showing all I see is Mike. All right, hold the phone. You can see Mike? Wow. All right, hold the phone. All right, how do I get out of this thing? How do I get rid of the show, Mike? It's my computer. Oh, there we go. All right. So what have I got to do here? Share screen again? Is that working? Yes. Okay. Here we go again. Image one. Pardon the green box. That's not really there. Image number two. Image three. And four. And five. And six. Seven. That's what it's what I think it is. That guy's crazy. And eight. Okay, going backwards. That's eight. That's seven. <laughs> At six, five, four, three. Well, two runners. Two. And one. Yeah, I'm going one more time. Yeah. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Still seeing one. Oh man. <clears throat> All right. Back up. We'll fix it. Hang on. For, the record, for those folks online, send your votes to email address vote at NGA photo dot. 
Right there, do it again. Oh, this one. Yeah. Oh, there. Okay. Maybe not. All right. Well, maybe. What are you guys seeing now? Anybody see in picture two? See in picture two. All right. Let me get this from the beginning here. There's picture one. Two. No. You got there's three. You got that? Number one. Speak more softly. All right. I don't know what we're doing here. Anybody? Let me just hang on a minute here. Trying to do sharing. Again, but I'm wondering what about eight shares going here. Okay, you guys see in number one? Three. Anybody? Saying number three. Yeah, number three. All right, hold hold the phone here. I we got about six screen chairs going here. So let me just undo some of this stuff. All right. Oh, where's our zoom here? Oops. There we go. All right. All right. Hold the phone. Start. Ah. All right, how do I get this thing? Where? Oh, there we go. All right. Trying again here. No, that's not what I want. All right. No, I got fire up. Oh, pretty cool. Next. I got to find Lisa's presentation. Where to go? Oh, there we go. All right. Back to Zoom. Oops. Click the photos and mail. Pardon? When you're on that screen, and once you hit the share, yeah. click the photos and as you go down the list on the left. All right, first I got to get back to the return to meeting. All right, now. That guy, that guy. All right, do you guys see in that first photo challenge monthly themes? Anybody? Anybody there? Did I cut you all off? Yeah, we see it. All right. You got a picture one? Anybody see picture one? Two, three. Uh, anybody see another than one? Maybe this thing is so slow it's not working. Sure. Okay, did you hear that? 
based on the issues, we're going to go ahead and Lisa's going to post them on the uh, Facebook page. So that way the people at home have a chance to vote. So she'll post it she'll to uh, get your vote in, but that way you folks at home will have a chance to vote. But now you know you need to come to the meetings. All right. I give up. <laughs> One more slide, at least for the people who are here, and that's to tell you about next month. And if we're lucky, I can get it to come up. There we go. So hopefully the folks at home can see this page. Our next meeting is going to be here at the Bowen on Friday, July 21st at 7 p.m., and we're going to do something a little bit different. Our uh, presentation is going to be Bobby Campbell, and we're going to do a little mini workshop here at the meeting. It'll be open to everybody, whether you're a paid member or not a paid member. Uh, but we're going to do a workshop on painting with light. And our photo challenge theme next month is backlight. So um, you'll want to come to the meeting next month, bring your camera. Uh, for the folks who join at home, we'll do the photo challenge at the beginning of the meeting. We really don't have a way to video the workshop part of it. So come to the meeting. Uh, by the way, somebody who came here tonight, thank you, David. Thanks to the folks at home who've tried to watch it. We'll see what happens with the video. And Lisa will post the uh, challenge online tonight and to the morning to uh, vote. And that's it. We'll see everybody in July. Thank you guys.